Sahari, who is the head of the Department of Criminology at Bar Ilan University, Israel. She is a, an editor of the chief of legal and criminological psychology, and uh, she has as a sort of a broad contribution to research the verifiability approach. Uh, and she will tell us a lot more about this this morning. So thank you very much for being here with us. Good morning. Um, I'm very uh, happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me, um, especially because um, uh, the EAPL is my uh, home conference. I uh, attended all the conferences since I uh, uh, finished my PhD in 2007, uh, except of one. I have good excuse for that, but later. Um, so I'm very honored to, to be here and to give a keynote. I, I want to engage a bit um, with uh, uh, Timothy's look um, uh, keynote yesterday, uh, which was very interesting and very challenging. And um, I think that uh, uh, it's, it's related to my talk. That's why I'm uh, engaging with that. Uh, I think that, um, in my view, um, the source of the problem uh, that we're dealing uh, in, uh, in the field of deception is the, um, um, is the thing that uh, some of us uh, put the search for cues as our prime uh, aim. And I don't think it's right to do that. I don't think it's uh, the, the, our prime aim to look for cues. This is a very applied aim. I think that our um, prime aim has to be scientific, meaning to uh, understand better the behavior of uh, liars and truth tellers and the, the cues supposed to be the output of this understanding, the product. And then they will be more uh, theoretically grounded and maybe more effective. So I hope that today um, I will try to deepen our understanding of the behavior of liars and truth tellers more than uh, introduce cues for deception. And I'm going to talk about verbal eye detection and to focus on the interplay between uh, memory and strategy. Uh, this interplay is uh, like an uh, intersection where my research uh, passes over the years and where it, it is developing now. So I will present uh, some uh, studies uh, that are uh, earlier and some uh, new data unpublished pre preliminary uh, to demonstrate my, um, my claims. Okay, so first I want to introduce my current team because they all contribute to uh, the collection of uh, data or the developments that I'm showing now. So we have uh, Mikey, Susan, and Han Su Green. They are both brilliant PhD students. And I will present some of uh, Han's uh, preliminary uh, results of her PhD first study. And um, we have uh, MA students in, in Bal Goldberg, Mo Avrahami and Shanil Anciano. Uh, they uh, currently do their uh, MA thesis and I'm going to present some of Mo Avrahami uh, preliminary data. And Svini Sin is a pro-academic. I think that some of you know him. He is an active police officer, but he is also a cognitive psychologist. And now he is... Um, formerly a guest um, expert researcher in my lab, and he has a, a lot of contribution to new developments uh, in my research, as I will show later. Okay, so there are, oh, I have to move uh, that and that as well. That's too complicated for me. Okay. Um, two main uh, players in uh, verbal eye detection are memory and strategy. Memory, of course, it's obvious 
that uh, it's relevant for true tellers because they recall the experiences uh, from their memory. But the question is if we should um, um, consider this factor of memory also for liars because uh, liars fabricate uh, the information they provide from their imagination. So, of course, my answer is yes, otherwise it will be boring. And, and I think that we should consider uh, for liars memory and strategy, not just strategy. With strategy, we attributed strategy usually for liars because they control the information that they uh, provide us, they try to regulate it. And we know from research, when we ask them if they used strategy, most of them say yes. Uh, and they, for example, they can uh, avoid uh, verifiable details. They can try to make their story simple or vague. So we know that for liars, we have to consider strategy. But the question is if we should uh, consider strategy also for truth tellers. And when we ask truth tellers in research if they use strategy, most of them say no. But if we look at the reasoning that they provide, so we see that they, um, they say that they don't use strategy because they simply say the whole truth. So telling the whole truth is also a strategy. And Coriat and Goldschmidt uh, pointed on the um, uh, strategic regulation uh, of memory accuracy. And they claim that uh, truth tellers try to be as much informative as possible and also uh, accurate. So they have to, to do the trade off between uh, being informative and accurate. And um, so they, they try to say the whole tr truth and nothing but the truth. And this is very important to consider that they have their, uh, this strategy because it means that they don't, uh, for example, don't add false details when they need to. When they want to succeed in the interview, they won't do it because of this strategy. That's why it's so, so important. Okay, so um, I argue, therefore, that to be efficient, lie detection approaches uh, has to incorporate both uh, the interplay between memory and um, strategy. And if this diagram uh, represents the interplay, so I think that uh, lie detection approaches has to be in the mutual area. This is the, the, the interplay, actually. So I want to locate uh, the um, approaches that I'm investigating and I'm going to talk about. So uh, I'm going to talk about the reality monitoring, which I believe that many of us are uh, um, familiar with. Uh, and the reality monitoring is actually a memory theory. And uh, by the reality memory, we expect truth tellers to provide more perceptual details uh, like uh, visions, sounds, smells, etc., and um, also to provide more uh, contextual details such as uh, times and locations because they have these details in their memory. They recall the experience from their memory. We uh, expect liars to provide less uh, such details, perceptual and contextual, because they have to fabricate them. Um, so the prediction of RM is the truth tellers provide accounts which are in detail. When I say which are in detail, I mean perceptual and contextual, uh, then liars. Um, the VA also uh, consider the perceptual and the contextual details, but um, uh, it also asks if they, uh, these details are verifiable or not verifiable. Can we check? Uh, their truthfulness or not. Because the VA suggests that uh, liars uh, use strategy, they try to avoid verification. So they try to provide as many details as possible, uh, as much as they can, because they fabricate these details, uh, to look uh, cooperative. But uh, 
to give uh, such details that we cannot verify. So um, uh, the prediction of the VA is the truth tellers provide accounts which are in verifiable details than liars. The SEP is a new development of the VA. So it based on the same um, rationale that uh, uh, liars use a strategy to avoid verification, but it suggest, suggests um, um, a different measurement of this strategy. So instead of uh, looking for verifiable details, to look for contextual details. Because the rationale of the SEP is that uh, the contextual details confers or confer the, the verifiability on the perceptual details. So, for example, if uh, I want to uh, inform you about a meeting that I have, I had yesterday, so I have many, many uh, perceptual details to, to give you. But if I don't tell you when uh, was this meeting or where was this meeting, it will be difficult for you to verify uh, my story. That's why the contextual details uh, are very important. And um, uh, Tzvi Nisin, uh, he initiated this idea. So it's actually uh, the credit is for him. And uh, the prediction is that truth tellers provide accounts which are in contextual details than liars. Now, if I take it another step, so I can say that the RM uh, suggests a, a qualitative indicator uh, to, to count the number of perceptual and contextual details, and the VA and SEP suggest quality, uh, qualitative uh, indicator to look for the type of the details, not the number, but the type of the details. And I suggest that uh, the strategy can be uh, unrevealed when we look for the type of the details and not the number of the details. So if we uh, want to make sure that we uh, understand what are the measures of these uh, approaches, so RM uh, look for the absolute number of the perceptual and contextual details. The VA looks for the uh, proportion of verifiable details. Uh, the SEP looks for the proportion of contextual details. It means that um, the VA and SEP suggest within subject measures. Uh, and this is very important in deception because uh, we want to uh, look for the behavior in relation to the, to the person itself. And uh, uh, within subject measures are less sensitive to external factors such as individual differences or uh, like gender or culture or um, passage of time, as I will try to, to show. Okay, so here we have the diagram, and after all I said, I think that it's uh, reasonable to locate RM in the memory circle, because the RM doesn't, um, uh, the measurement of the RM is unable to cope with strategy. If, if a liar um, add false um, details to uh, his or her account, uh, the RM cannot detect that. That's why I look at it, it in the memory circle. And, okay, it's a bit, uh, it's supposed to be sad. Uh, <laughs> In the interplay, uh, we have VA and SEP because they based on strategy and, of course, on memory. You cannot avoid memory when you uh, uh, talk about deception. So uh, I can also say that RM uh, make a difference between true and false memories, while VA and SEP uh, make difference between true and self-manipulated memories. Now, uh, this is, uh, if you are not familiar with this term, it's because it's my invitation. <laughs> uh, so, and what I mean by that, what, what is the difference between false memories and self-manipulated memories? Uh, self, uh, false memories, we know, that uh, doesn't uh, necessarily include 
uh, the intent to deceive. So I, I can uh, believe that I experienced something that I never experienced. Uh, I do it by mistake. So I don't have the motivation to use strategy as adding false details to my memory. And the RM can do that. It can, because uh, the RM uh, make the difference, uh, it, it doesn't uh, consider strategy. It can um, uh, make the difference between uh, true and false memories. But the VA and SEP, they consider strategy. And uh, I wanted to make the difference between uh, a false memory that doesn't include uh, the intention to deceive and another type of memory, as I see it as a memory, uh, and that's why I termed it self-manipulated memory. It means a lie. It means that the interviewee um, um, creates a memory in a manipulative, manipulative manner and uh, in, in the aim to deceive us. That, that's the meaning. And uh, the, the, the difference is not just semantic, it's also essential. Um, uh, so uh, the, the term uh, uh, embodies uh, two important insights in my, in my view. First of all, that lie is also a memory. It, it, the, the product of the interplay between memory and strategy and uh, uh, if we consider it as, as a memory, we know that it has um, characteristics of memory. So different from false memory, different from truthful memory, but it still has um, um, characteristics of a memory. And uh, the second uh, insight is that we know that memory has boundaries. I mean, the, the truth teller is, is limited. It is, uh, the truth tellers are limited by uh, the details they recall and the details they remember. So they inform us about, even if they want to be cooperative, they can inform us all, only about details they recall and remember. Uh, so I argue that uh, a lie, uh, a self-manipulated memory is also, it also has boundaries because once the liar uh, creates this memory. Once he uh, uh, provides an account, he creates a memory, and then he has to refer to this first account. So the first account uh, is, uh, he, he is supposed to remember it, for example, and, uh, and uh, he, he, uh, the interview, he wants to be uh, consistent with this first account, and that's why it's like creating a memory. Okay, so now I want to uh, show you some uh, data and to show, to show you how it works, this model, the, this uh, interplay uh, model between memory and strategy. So if memory and strategy are the main actors, uh, so uh, I want to introduce some uh, supporting uh, actors. Uh, actors. Um, so memory, uh, I can focus or I can uh, demonstrate uh, the passage of time. Of course, we know the passage of time uh, impact memory. And uh, individual differences, they are also impact memory because uh, they can mediate the way that uh, a person um, uh, code um, an experience or um, remember it or the way uh, the interviewee report, the, the, the memory, it all can be related to individual differences. A strategy, so I have here uh, three types of strategies. Uh, lie type, uh, if I use embedded lie, I embed uh, truthful details into my uh, account, it's a strategy. If I use concealment lie or outright lie, it's a strategy. Um, information type is the uh, information I uh, strategically uh, choose to provide uh, and what I, want, I don't want to provide, I want to withhold. And um, the countermeasures, of course, uh, when I know how the technique uh, used uh, to detect me, 
when I, I know the working of, of this technique, uh, so I, I can try to uh, disturb it, to disturb it from um, a lie verdict. Um, so this is also a strategy. Uh, so memory and strategy, of course, they don't stand alone. They also interact, that's the, the whole point of uh, interplay. So, uh, the, for example, the strategy can uh, impact the way uh, we uh, report our memory, and the memory can influence uh, what strategy we will choose. And I, I will demonstrate it shortly. Information protocols, uh, it's actually when we inform our participants or our interviewees about a procedure or about some fact, and we use it a lot in, uh, in research uh, to see the influence of informing uh, the interviewees about the working of the technique. Like we want, for example, to know if they can uh, activate countermeasures. So um, the information protocols is an uh, outside variable, but it can impact strategy and memory. So, uh, for example, information protocol can activate uh, countermeasures, but information protocol also can attract the attention of the interviewee and then impact the way he reports his memory. Okay, so I want to, um, to demonstrate it with data. So here we have two uh, more crime uh, studies. They are related to one each other because, as you see, uh, Tzu Green um, uh, added participants to the uh, data published in 2018 in JAMAC. Um, so both, uh, let's say, the, the original study, uh, this was the design. So we had um, um, uh, truthful interviewees and also liars, and uh, they were interviewed uh, immediately, or they were interviewed uh, in a delay, or repeatedly. So uh, the, I, I put it in gray, the repeatedly, because uh, I don't, I, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk only about uh, these uh, other two conditions of time. Uh, so, the, the, what I'm going to, to show here is, I'm not tall enough, so um, that I'm going to, to show the interplay between the passage of time and the lie type and information type. Um, so, here we have um, uh, the veracity and time, so uh, this is the passage of time. And uh, the lie type and information type, they are the dependent variables. So in the um, original study, uh, we um, looked for richness in detail and also type of detail. Type of detail is whether the, the detail was false or truthful. We um, asked the participants at the end of the experience to mark all the details, if they are false or truthful, so we have this uh, information. Um, uh, 94 participants, it means just in these uh, two conditions without a repeated condition. And what uh, Hen did here, she added participants in the aim to uh, look, to reanalyze the data and to look for uh, the SEP, so to examine the SEP, the validity of the SEP. So I will show you the both studies um, um, results. Okay, so information, I, I'm starting with the richness in detail, and we can see that both studies uh, um, achieve the same pattern of result, the same interaction. So we have interaction between veracity and time, and what happened here that truth tellers provided uh, more uh, or richer accounts than liars uh, in both uh, time conditions, which is good. But the problem is 
that the uh, truth tellers, the, the um, number of details they provided decreased over time. So they provided less details in the delayed uh, condition than in the immediate condition, meaning that uh, richness in detail, uh, effectivity also decreased over time. This is uh, less good. Uh, so if we look for the liars, uh, what you see here, it's not significant, so they provided the same amount, the same number of details uh, over time. Now, this is, I think, more interesting because here uh, we look for the type, the, the type of the detail, if the detail is false or truthful, and we got, uh, I think, uh, insight about the behind scene of the interaction. So we have an interaction, we saw a decrease uh, over time, but, uh, but here we can see uh, behind this uh, interaction, behind the scene. So what we see for uh, truth tellers, we see that they provided only truthful details. It's not uh, surprising. Uh, otherwise, we would define them as liars. Um, and, uh, and we see the decrease and we understand it because they use the strategy to, to tell the whole truth but nothing but the truth. So if they forgot, and probably they forgot details over time, so they don't add false details to their accounts and that's why we see a decrease. Now if we look at the liars, so the liars uh, provided the same number of details um, immediately or after a delay, it was a delay of two weeks. And, um, uh, but what changed is the ratio between the truthful details and the false details. So we can see a decrease in the truthful details and increase in the false details. Meaning that liars also forget, they forget truthful details. And uh, this is uh, good, uh, good news because uh, embedded lies are very problematic in verbal lie detection. When, when liars include truthful details uh, in their accounts, it's very problematic for verbal lie detection. So we see that their ability to provide um, uh, embedded lies decrease over time. This is good. And we also can learn, of course, they could fix it. In contrast to the truth tellers, they, they could fix it because they, uh, they, um, they saw that they cannot um, use embedded lie, so they changed their strategy. So instead of using embedded lie, they added false details. They have much more um, a degree of freedom. So the memory factor plays a role among both truth tellers and liars but interact differently with their strategies. And uh, this is a good demonstration, I think, of the interplay between memory and strategy. If we want to know what happens with SEP, so here we didn't find any interaction between veracity and time, so uh, there was no decrease uh, over time. Uh, we can explain that because it's a within subject measure and uh, the decrease uh, was similar for contextual details and for perceptual details, so the ratio remained the same. And that's why I'm saying that uh, within subject measures are very important uh, in deception because they bypass some of the problems that we have. Um, uh, what we, what we uh, observed is uh, another um, uh, interaction between veracity and detail type. Here we didn't uh, look for a truthful or uh, false details as in the original study. So when I say detail type, I mean uh, contextual or perceptual. And we see that um, uh, truth tellers provided uh, more or let's say the difference in contextual details uh, were higher than uh, the difference or greater than the difference in perceptual details. I show this because uh, it's um, uh, indirect uh, evidence 
for the rationale of SEP that liars try to, provide, to uh, avoid contextual details. So I, 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 I present here uh, one study, but I can tell you that um, I checked it across other data that we have, four data datas that we have, and we didn't um, um, publish them yet, and we saw uh, the same pattern. So I hope that the pattern is stable, let's say. Okay. Uh, so we talked about when memory and strategy meet uh, time, and now I want to talk about when memory and strategy meet gender. So what we did here, we uh, again, we took um, a published data and we reanalyzed it because we wanted to look for SEP. The original data uh, used uh, richness in detail. We measured richness in detail in the original data uh, by scale, we rank, we rank the, the richness in detail on scale and we also included uh, emotions. So in the, in the new data, um, um, we counted uh, rather than uh, rank the richness in detail and we uh, counted only the perceptual and contextual details and then we could calculate also the SEP, not just RM, uh, but also the SEP. So uh, what we did here, we had uh, females and males because we wanted to look for uh, gender differences. This is the memory-related uh, factor. And we used uh, information protocol, so we encouraged them to provide uh, as many details as they can. Uh, we told them that uh, th we, uh, the chance that we will believe them uh, will be greater if, uh, if they provide many, many details. So we encourage them by information protocol. And of course, we had uh, liars and truth tellers, and they provided us life stories. It wasn't a more crime study. It was uh, life stories. So, yeah, so what we wanted to see is the information type, which is uh, richness in detail and SEP, and also countermeasures. Okay, so what we found? Uh, we found an interaction between IP and veracity. Uh, so no gender differences. Actually, it's in contrast with what we found in the original study when we ranked the richness in detail and included also emotions, which can be uh, relevant for life stories. Um, here we didn't find anything, not main effect, not interaction with gender, which is good, I think. And, but we, we did find uh, IP and veracity interaction. And what we saw that uh, we could not differ between truth tellers and liars when they were not informed. And this is of course a concern, but it's getting worse when we inform them. Because then, uh, in contrast to the prediction of uh, RM, we saw that liars provided more details than truth tellers. So the information protocol encouraged them, encouraged both uh, uh, groups to provide more details. We see that the truth tellers also provided more details when they were informed, but they are more limited than the liars because they want to stick with the truth. The liars, they don't care about uh, sticking with the truth, so they could uh, add uh, false details. And we cannot detect their strategy. Uh, okay, uh, if we look at SAP, so here uh, we found only main effect, so no interaction. We didn't see uh, that the information protocol uh, affect them, uh, no gender effect and no uh, interaction with gender, which is also good. But I think that we cannot uh, be too happy with these results because the information protocol uh, encouraged the participant to provide perceptual and contextual details. So of course we didn't, uh, the, the information protocol did not affect SEP. If we want to see if a uh, participant or interviewees uh, use countermeasures, so we have to inform them about uh, the working of SEP. 
uh, to, to uh, ask them to provide more contextual details. So we still don't know if uh, SEP is sensitive to countermeasures or not. Okay, last thing is uh, when memory and strategy meet the VA. So what happens there? So it's uh, a bit odd because uh, the VA is studied for a long time, I think 10 years now, and uh, still we don't have uh, much uh, to say about individual differences because we didn't check it, and about passage of time because we didn't check it. The only thing that I can tell you and um, uh, those of you that are familiar with the, the literature of variability approach, it won't be new. Uh, that's uh, when we use, uh, what happens when we use uh, information protocol, how it impacts the information type and the countermeasures. So what we uh, observed uh, also in uh, meta-analysis of uh, Panela et al, um, uh, we observed uh, an interaction between uh, IP and veracity interaction uh, in a good way. In a good way because we saw that uh, truth tellers which want to cooperate, they want to be informative, this is their strategy, informative and uh, accurate. So they, uh, when we informed them that we look for verifiable details, they provided more verifiable details. But uh, the liars could not do it because it's very risky for them to provide uh, false verifiable details. They can provide some verifiable details because they embed truthful details in their uh, accounts, but uh, they cannot provide as many as truth tellers and um, uh, they could not add uh, false verifiable e details to their accounts. And then what happened is that the difference between truth tellers and liars uh, is greater when we inform participants in, co uh, in, relation, um, in um, a comparison to when we did not inform them. So, I will end um, uh, this part because I try to, um, uh, to save some time for a discussion. Uh, so, um, I, I will end this part by the same uh, message that I started, that verbal eye detection approaches must consider the memory strategy interplay if we want to be uh, effective because memory strategy interplay defines the reporting manner of truth tellers and liars, and consequently um, assist us in uh, make the difference between them, to, to detect them, to detect the truth tellers and to detect the liars. Maybe one thing that we can do, because sometimes I feel that we are like uh, two groups. There are memory researchers and there are deception researchers. And uh, deception researchers usually uh, don't uh, take into account uh, the memory literature and uh, they don't include components of memory uh, into the uh, studies. And I think that uh, if we want to do better research, so we have to, uh, to include much more uh, the, the memory because it's, it's obviously there. I mean, if we want to differ between truth tellers and liars, truth tellers, are based on their memory. And we saw also that also liars uh, use their memory. So we must do it and then uh, we will uh, deepen our understanding and uh, we'll be able to, uh, um, to develop more sound uh, frameworks and better techniques. So I think uh, we should do that. Um, so, the, the, what I want to do is to um, uh, present some questions uh, for you, and all the questions are uh, those that I am concerned of. Uh, so maybe uh, we can uh, um, we can see what what you think because there are many experts in this audience, um, and all the questions are related to how we implement. Uh, our knowledge and our techniques uh, in the field. 
and, um, uh, and that's why I want to, um, to tell you about um, a new project in LCP, in the Journal of uh, uh, Legal and Criminological Psychology, uh, that I initiate now uh, to invite you, actually, uh, to um, suggest uh, commentaries about uh, a certain policy or certain technique uh, that you think that you have what to say about it, from the literature, of course, and uh, the aim is to write something that will be uh, for practitioners, so to transfer our knowledge in a way that practitioners can understand uh, what are the conclusions that arise from our research uh, regarding a certain policy or regarding a certain uh, technique. So if one of you or many of you uh, think that they can contribute, uh, please email me and we can see uh, what we can do. Okay, so here are my questions. And I want to see them. Um, I, yeah, so I, I will explain my questions and then um, uh, you can refer to, to them or you can just refer to whatever you, you want, yes? Uh, so uh, one thing is uh, we develop, we uh, create knowledge and we develop uh, techniques and ideas and, and then some of our ideas, for example, cognitive interview is implemented uh, in, the, in the field. And um, what happens is that, that when, when you take something that was developed in the academia and you take it to the field, uh, it doesn't look the same anymore. Because the field, the practitioners, they must adjust the, the tool or the technique. Uh, they must consider uh, their um, laws and uh, regulations and reality because sometimes in the lab it's not uh, the same as the reality. So, and then they adjusted the tools. Uh, when they do that, sometimes um, the tool, uh, the adjustment is very significant. And then I ask myself if we don't must go back to the lab and uh, examine the new version of the technique because otherwise we, uh, by, we, we don't uh, mean to do that, but we promote pseudoscience because they can say, yeah, the cognitive interview is uh, evidence-based. Look how many research we have. But the way they implement it is so far from uh, the, the original protocol that maybe they use uh, pseudoscience. So uh, this is an issue that I, I wish to um, uh, hear what you think about. I can tell you that we just published, uh, Tzvini Sin and myself, a paper in JAMAC about uh, how um, uh, cognitive-based techniques are implemented in, the, um, uh, in Israel. And then, for example, you can see what happened to a cognitive interview, what happened to CIT in polygraph, uh, and other, other uh, tools. And you can see, uh, of course, we explained why, but you can see that sometimes the difference is not, it's not small. Uh, so the second one, second question is uh, top-down or bottom-up? Bottom what is the best way to implement tools? Shall I go, if I have a good tool, shall I go to the uh, decision makers and the policy makers or shall I go to the end users to train the, the police officers that has to use uh, this tool? Um, where to start? This is the second question. And the third question is, uh, should the tools be widely used or only by experts? If I take the model of uh, the Israeli police, they have a unit of uh, uh, psychological, investigative psychology, and uh, they have experts there, and the experts uh, provide uh, the, the service for the, the um, uh, investigators, for, for the police officers. Uh, but maybe we should do it differently. Maybe we have to train each police officer to, do, to use our tools. 
So this is our, my questions and I open it for you. Thanks so much for the It was great and um, a really useful and sensible suggestions for moving forward with integrating things that are inherently involved in our processes. These Thank questions you. are great and we could probably spend more rest of the day talking about these questions. Um, um, I, I don't really know where to start because we've hit all of them in all of our work. Um, we've done it from the lab, we've done it from the field. I of those things. More recently, I think the thing we found that is working better, that it requires a very particular structure to work in, is a sort of close co-working at key points with the field, but never forgetting you're coming with your theoretical background, you're coming with your knowledge, but you're providing tools from random suggestions in the field about what happens in the world with very poor tools. Because they have no basis in our psychological theory and understand, and you can't account for what happens. If you can't account for what happens theoretically, you've got nothing. So I think that's uh, going straight to the field is bad. But that doesn't mean you have to go to the field. You have to go to the field. You have to listen very hard. You have to understand the structure of the problem that stakeholders, whoever they might be, whether it's police or military or security or whatever, you have to understand the structure of the problem they're having and then take what we do actually know to give them a, a robust suggestion or a solution of some kind to a specific problem. Now, then it has to go through a process of, will it actually work? There's no point designing fancy things that will fall apart in the field. Yeah. Or will it worse be used in counterintuitive, uh, ridiculous ways <laughs> and then your science is broken? So, uh, for us, we have projects now where I think we're on a path where we've ha had that kind of input, input from science, input from fields, but we've integrated them together rather than being pushed by one, too much by one side or the other so that you end up with either something unusable or something that's just never going to be used. So I, I guess that would be my starter, but these are super questions. Thank you. I know a bit your opinions because we also have discussions about that. And I think that um, uh, Tzvini Sin uh, suggested um, um, like a model how to, how to do that, how to do this way. Uh, because we work together, he is practitioner and uh, I am not. And I think that you also uh, work, at many of you, uh, work very closely with practitioners and what he says is that um, the academia should uh, start developing uh, the, the, the model is uh, TPP, is a theory protocol procedure. And he, he thinks that the theory, of course, it's our job, but when we develop the protocol, uh, so we have to do it with the practitioners and of course, um, it's, uh, it uh, has to be adjusted to the um, specific um, area. So uh, if I want to develop a protocol uh, for the police, it's not the same as uh, for uh, airport security. So I have to adjust it with them and then to leave them because uh, the procedure uh, is something that uh, many times they cannot uh, uh, discuss uh, the procedure with me because I'm not part of them. I, I understand this point of the procedure, but it's a bit risky because uh, if uh, their procedure um, um, requires more uh, adjustment, uh, so this is a problem. But I think it's the best we can do, so. I agree. I think lucky we get practitioners like the ones we work with who are good at, like, so we work in a lot of security settings, but we don't get to know what exactly is happening, we're just not permitted to know. And but if you're lucky, you have a practitioner who can describe in other terms, and then you can go through a process of fixing or suggesting. The worst thing is when several years down the line you hear something that is, you know, so far down the route from what you said in the first place, and then you have to try to fix it. But, 
Africa. It's not easy, but it is it's the only way to go. And would you go back to the lab to, to examine the validity of uh, the adjusted uh, version? I don't know, but there's so many potential factors missing. <coughs> I mean, obviously, it was a radical change. I don't know anything that's had a radical change, to say, a virus is probably. The fundamentals are always kind of core. Um, and I, there's things they, they might, I've heard that have sometimes happened in the field. I wouldn't bother wasting my time testing in the lab because it's a stupid idea. You know, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, maybe. It would depend how far the version was. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your really excellent talk. Thank and, you. And I would uh, address the third question, and I think it is really, um, well, I don't know whether we could even talk about two bits, because I think what we really need to do is like test many theories for specific situations. And I think this has been addressed very well in your uh, talk, because I think we have been looking for cues to deception for too long, actually, uh, because um, deception is not a homogeneous activity. I mean, deception can be to pretend to have a memory if you don't have one, and it can also be to, to pretend to have no memory if you have one, which is a very different, uh, different thing from a cognitive point of view. And so therefore, I think with these um, having this memory and aspect in mind and this strategy, uh, strategy memory in mind, we can look at different uh, deception tasks and test different like mini theories. For as we said, for an embedded life, it is completely different because people can draw on episodic memory, so they have a lot of information there. And then you have always to, to check what kind of information you have there anyway. And so you can simply leave the whole this passage of the statement. You, it, it doesn't, it's not informative to look at this passage of the statement. Uh, on, yeah. But in other cases, people cannot draw on episodic memory. They have to draw on scheme information. So that would expect more uh, differences in, in, in quality uh, and in, um, in details. So um, we, if we take this into account, I, I think we will, we will come much more forward. And uh, this is also, this, you can do that in the lab, but this is also the first in the uh, field. For example, <coughs> if you look at the statements about sexual abuse, this will, this either happened or it didn't. Uh, children cannot refer to episodic memory from somewhere else, because this will always be a sexual abuse. True. But um, in a, <coughs> sorry, it was too loud yesterday. <laughs> 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 but if you, for example, in a rape case, um, there might be that the, um, the suspect says that was consensual. So there might be a lot of information uh, would, which um, would people uh, which um, okay, and that's what them can draw, uh, can refer to episodic memory, and there's only little um, bit of information left which we can actually um, focus on. So, uh, so I think this is really important to have this in mind that uh, the subject of continuous activity that we will then find cues which are for different situations. On deception, even if you use, I think even if you use a geographic uh, approach, I think this thing of um, visual uh, comparisons are very good and important. But even then, we don't. I, I'm not. I'm not optimistic that we can find anything because all these, acute, all these, what you mentioned are actually cues to memory. There is no cue to deception. Um, and it is more the other ones around that you think that people would refer to memory, then they wouldn't act like these liars that do. But it is not really key to deception. And I think we have to change the perspective to look for cues for memory, and that will bring us further. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's um, it's another. Um, I think we're out of time, but one sentence. I think that it's a um, um, 
Another thing that we, we should remember that uh, deception can uh, take place also in a um, context that memory is not involved. Or memory like uh, if I um, involved but uh, relatively in a small, uh, like uh, identity, if I uh, false identity, for example, I don't use uh, episodic memory and then uh, my talk is much less uh, relevant. So thank you, I don't want to keep you here. Thank you very much. <laughs>